conditional probability. This idea of thinking about the chance of something, the probability, when you have some given conditions, like this is the accuracy of the test, and this is how many people are likely to have the disease in the population, right? These are all conditions, conditions which affect the probability of something. And so this is a textbook, literally a textbook example of what it means to think about conditional probability and why it's counterintuitive. So let's think about this from the point of a simple example. What I want to do is develop your intuition for how conditional probability works. And hopefully for some of you, this will just ring some bells. Yeah, I remember how this works. And then what we're going to do, which is new, is we're going to formalize that with some, some formulas and that kind of thing. Okay. So example situation, we're going to say we roll two dice. So this is like as, as classical as you can get for a probability situation. So imagine the two dice in your hand, we roll it. Okay. Here's my first question for you. What's the probability that, we, that one of the dice, at least one of the dice, will be a six? What is the probability? of at least one, I should write the word one, six. Okay, now don't just tell me the answer, but who, raise your hand if you feel like you have an instinctive, quick response to that. I, I think I know what the probability is. Anyone? I'm not gonna ask what it is, I just wanna get a sense of who's got one. Okay, interesting, all right, hands down. When you've got an instinctive probability, that's great, okay? But for the vast majority of you don't, and even if you do and you want to confirm it, right? We should use tools to confirm, to get a sense of what might this be, what would the calculation be? So I'm going to ask us to use a tool that we've introduced before. This is called an array, right? I want to talk about all of my sample space and represent it in a visual form. So there are two dice. What are the options on each of the dice? What could I possibly roll? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So here's one of the dice. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I've got the other die, which happens to be identical. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, in the past, you might have called an array a dot diagram, if you remember that from stage five. So I'm going to put some dots here, each one of which represents an event that is equally likely to happen because we're just assuming they're fair dice. OK, so go ahead, get this array down with me. And we need to have all of these options here. I think I've got them reasonably lined up. That'll do. OK. So when we think about probability in general, we're always thinking about a fraction. What's on the denominator of the fraction? That's the easy part. It's the size of the sample space, all of the events that could happen. And what's lovely about an array is it just tells you right there what the sample space is, what the size of it. It's how many dots there are, which in this case is 36. Very good. So that was the easy part. Now, then we think about the numerator, which takes a little more thought, but not that much in this situation. How many times is there a, what we call a favorable event, right? That's the thing we're interested in. So on this diagram, and you might want to grab out another color if you've got one, how many times does the favorable event happen? Well, let's have a look, right? I'm looking for sixes, right? Well, I can see it over here, if one of the dies, dice has a six, then all of these, all of these are favorable events. Do you agree? It's like, cool, I got one, right? But these, of course, are not the only ones. Where are the others? Yeah, that horizontal row down the bottom. OK, so I'm going to circle these. OK, so again, what's charming about an array is it tells you just physically, right? How many are there? You can just count the dots. How many dots are there? There are 11, right? And uh, famously, it's not 12 because you don't count this event twice, even though I've circled it twice, one from the row and one from the column. Um, it's the one event. There's only a single way to roll two sixes, so I only count it once. So far, so good. So there's our answer, okay? And if you feel like, if you put your hand up before, you're like, oh, I had an intuition, that's what I think it is, um, then well done, if you got it right. Okay, this was not conditional probability. This is just stock standard probability. We didn't have any, excuse me, conditions that we already knew to be true. So now I'm going to reveal some extra bits here, okay? Suppose it's not you rolling the dice, suppose it's me, right? I roll the dice, I've got them in my hands, and then I open my hand and I show you one of the dice. And I say, hey, look, there's a six here. There's a six in my hand. Okay. So suppose we say it is known, it is known that there is one six. 
Suppose it's known that there's one six. Now I'm going to ask you the probability of a different event. If this is what we know, what is the probability that we have two sixes? Think about it for a second. Enact it again, right? I've got the two dice rolled, shaken up. I show you one of them and I say, hey, look, this one's a six. What do you think is the chance that they are both sixes? Have a think. What do you reckon, Lizzie? One out of six. One out of six. One out of six. Now, this is not a bad guess, right? Because you're like, I don't need to worry about this one anymore, right? In order for this to have both sixes, I really only need to worry about this guy, right? And we know the chances, it's a fair die, right? One in six. And one in six is a good instinctive response. However, if you think about what we have just established, this is the whole idea. This is why we all struggled with the medical example before, right? It's actually not the right sample space, right? This condition, it changes the sample space, right? No longer, I'm gonna get another color here. No longer can I, for example, say that this guy here, this is impossible, right? Because I'm already holding out one of the sixes for you. So you know they can't both be one. What other ones are impossible? Give me an example. You've got plenty to choose from. Two and two, also impossible. Give me another one. Three and three. Also impossible. And we could keep doing this, right? You could do it another 25 times. These are all impossible. Do you agree? In fact, the only things that are possible, and when I say possible, what we mean is the only things in the sample space are the things I've already circled. Do you agree? Right? These things are my new sample space. So when I construct my, whoops, it's over here. When I construct my fraction, just like I normally do, right? When I'm constructing the sample space down here, it's no longer out of 36. It's not even out of six because I'm not considering a single die on its own. I'm considering both of them together. The conditions affect both. So this sample space is the, the, the favorable that you had before. It's, it's 11, okay? Now have a look again, right? What Leslie got right was the favorable event. There is only one way for this to happen, but it's not one out of six. It's one out of the 11 that you've got here. Does this make sense? Which is very counterintuitive, but hopefully this is a good enough argument for you to convince you that actually any of these could be possible. You didn't know which die I had in my hand, right? Does that make sense? And that's why it could be this one, or it could be that one. And that's a bit counterintuitive, but true nonetheless. One out of 11. Make sense? Okay. What I'd like you to do is think about formalizing this. Like we're trying to use our intuition at the moment and intuition is helpful, but it can also be enormously untrustworthy.